Hello. Well, first of all, before we get to, we have three topics on the show today. Before we get to those, I have a news bulletin, which is that uh, Congressman Jim Himes, who represents, of course, Fairfield County, and it's, well, basically Fairfield County, um, is uh, calling for an impeachment inquiry, which is, you know, it's kind of a big thing. I mean, this is Jim Himes. This is not Jim Ocasio Himes. This is Jim Himes, you know, pretty moderate uh, Democrat. So uh, it, it means something. I don't really know what. Um, so <laughs> that's why it's not one of the big three topics. A little bit later on the show, we're going to talk about the Curtis Flowers case. We've talked about that two or th- two times, I think, already on the show. And uh, there was a Supreme Court decision that, uh, well, I mean, uh, spoiler, it, it certainly went Flowers' way. Uh, that may not be enough to set him free. But we'll tell you all about that in the second segment uh, with one of the producers from In the Dark, the terrific podcast, which has focused on this. And then in the final segment, as far as I'm concerned, let's call them what they are. They are concentration camps. I mean, I, I think they pretty well fit the definition. Uh, we are uh, imprisoning people along the border in inhumane conditions and in a way that is intended to kind of keep them out of sight. Uh, so we'll talk about that uh, also. But we're going to begin, you know, as some of you have divined, I'm really kind of intrigued by Andrew Yang. I don't really know where I come down on him. I'm not hashtag Yang gang. You know what I am? I'm Yang curious. Uh, so, <laughs> so Andrew Yang, for those of you not uh, forgivably not able to follow all this, is one of the now 24. Is Sestak number 24? I think so. Uh, 24 candidates, uh, you know, significant candidates for uh, pre- for the presidential nomination on the Democratic side. Uh, one of the reasons that make, one of the reasons that Yang is significant. He's a businessman with no governance experience, uh, and a guy who has also worked in the nonprofit sector. Um, what makes him significant is that his support came early and strong from non traditional sources, such that he's numerically eligible to participate, for example, in this week's debate. So he will be uh, on the Thursday night. Uh, debate, uh, the second of two, uh, <laughs> part two of the Democratic field. Uh, and so we want to talk a little bit more about this. Like, you know, I mean, he really has a lot of ideas. He has 109 policy proposals on his website. Um, and that's a lot. Uh, and he is speaking to a bunch of people who are, who I think it's fair to say, do not typically feel spoken to by the political process. Um, and they fall all over the political spectrum and the ideological spectrum and the demographic demographic spectrum, although I think it's also fair to say that most of Yang's fans and supporters are pretty young. Joining us uh, to say uh, all of this and much more on a far better informed basis than I just did is Will Summer, a tech reporter for The Daily Beast. And right away, there's Will, there's sort of a giveaway that I'm interviewing a tech reporter about a political <laughs> candidate. I mean, there's something, there's some truth embedded in that, right? That Andrew Yang is really maybe the first digital candidate in a, in a genuine sense. Yeah. I mean, you know, Andrew Yang is, is really uh, sort of an internet phenomenon. Uh, you know, this is a guy who basically came out of nowhere, had very little name recognition. And uh, this week he's going to be on the Democratic debate stage, thanks in large part to all of his internet fans who donated and put him over the threshold. So how, how did he do that? I mean, look, a lot of people could think about getting on the Internet and trying to make a name for themselves. What did Yang, what kind of game theory did he bring to this that was different? So it's a couple of things. You know, he has a very uh, sort of eye-catching proposal, uh, which is his universal basic income in which everyone in the country would get $1,000 a month. So, I mean, that's kind of the, the, the first thing he does. And then, uh, you know, he, he went on a lot of podcasts, a lot of uh, radio shows that are popular with young people, uh, whether that's The Breakfast Club in New York, which is kind of a hip hop show or the Joe Rogan podcast, which is a hugely popular podcast uh, with young men, particularly. Right. So uh, let's combine the two things that you just said. Here's Andrew Yang on the Joe Rogan show talking about universal basic income. Yeah. So uh, I've been driven to universal basic income in part because I've been looking at the numbers. The five most common jobs in the United States right now are administrative and clerical work, retail and sales, food service and food prep, truck driving and transportation and manufacturing. Those five jobs comprise about half of all American jobs. Only 32% of Americans graduate from college. So the average American is a high school grad doing one of these five jobs. And if you look at it, technology is already doing a number on each of these jobs. 
Like the first administrative and clerical includes call center workers, and AI is in the process of uh, taking over that job. Retail and sales, 30% of malls are closing in the next four years. So the, the danger here is to think of it as artificial intelligence is coming. It's actually already eating up the most common jobs in our economy, and it's driving Americans uh, into distress in various ways in the numbers. You know, Will, it seems to me that if there's one thing, one of the many things that distinguishes Yang, and I think in a kind of a positive sense, and it's something that I've heard young people respond to, is that for the most part, candidates talk about what's going on right now and a little bit about what happened in the past, and they may cock a little bit of an eye towards the future, but not much. Yang really is talking a lot about the future. He's got some ideas about how to solve the problems right in front of us, but he's also, particularly as he starts talking about uh, artificial intelligence, intelligence, automation, uh, robot overlords. Uh, he's, he's also talking about the future in a way that you don't hear candidates do that much. Right, exactly. I mean, he's talking about, you know, 20 years from now, uh, when we're looking at, say, uh, self-driving trucks, putting all the truck drivers in the country out of business, and then all the people who depend on uh, those jobs. So, I mean, you know, he's, he's saying, how are we going to grapple with these, these problems that are decades in the future? Right. And I think, you know, for a, a generation uh, of millennials, and, and maybe people a little bit older than millennials, they feel as though they're living in a dysfunctional and maybe dystopian world that was created by people who never looked 20 years into the future, that baby boomers like me and people roughly around our age group, um, you know, th that was our big problem. We didn't look 20 years down the road. You could see why Yang would resonate. Yeah, I mean, I, I think he appeals in part to young people because, uh, you know, as you say, this is someone who, unlike a lot of candidates, is looking more to the future. I mean, obviously, the biggest example of baby boomers ignoring the future or that they won't be around for is uh, global warming. But, you know, a uh, Andrew Yang is uh, looking at both that and, and other things in a way that I think speaks to young people who are concerned about these issues. Um, and the other thing he is is. Um, well, actually, let me just say a little bit more about that and get you to react to it. Um, so I, I was looking at the video version of his appearance on The Breakfast Club. The Breakfast Club is a hip hop um, uh, show uh, where, for example, Lizzo would probably be a slightly more typical uh, Breakfast Club guest. And, and you know, what? then I started reading the comments. And obviously, comments are n not, a, not a reliable metric. But a number of people in the comments were saying, I don't vote but I'm going to vote for this guy. I've never voted before, but I'm going to vote for this guy. And then other people saying, explaining very carefully to them, all right, well, you have to vote in the primary, which might mean you might have to register with a party and explaining all this to them. And I mean, obviously, people who historically don't vote, they're not a huge wave. But if you can mo mobilize a whole bunch of these people, particularly in a crowded field like this, once again, game theory favors you a little bit. Right. That's exactly right. I mean, you know, it, it, and the idea, it, it, a lot of candidates talk about, you know, what they want to offer people. But Andrew Yang is saying very specifically, you know, vote for me. And if I win, you'll get $12,000 a year. So, you know, that appeals to a lot of people. And I, I should say it's not just young people. I mean, I, I think a majority of the, the Yang base is kind of very online young people. Uh, but, you know, I talked to a, a middle aged woman who's living in Paraguay now, uh, an American citizen who essentially had to leave the country because she couldn't afford to live here. So, uh, you know, she's a dedicated Yang supporter because she thinks if this universal basic income happened, she'd be able to afford to come back to the United States. Right. And I, I was also impressed on The Breakfast Club uh, by his ability to explain things in, in very clear language, too. Maybe because he's not part of a public policy machine. Maybe because he hasn't run in a lot of elections and learned to kind of focus group his comments and weave in a lot of uh, uh, of ambiguities <laughs> the way politicians like to do. You know, I think people respect the fact that they can usually understand what he's talking about. Right, exactly. I mean, he he does he, he doesn't come off like a regular politician. I think um, it's been interesting to see his comparative success, at least in getting on the debate stage, compared to uh, people like you know some governors, what have you, who are running uh, in twenty twenty, who were not able to get that same kind of support. So uh, you know, it, it, I think he appeals to people. He's got a lot of kind of I don't know if I'd call them outlandish ideas, but he's an ideas guy and he's throwing a lot of ideas out there. So I think people uh, you know appreciate that. I will say that although I've been very intrigued by Andrew Yang, and I sort of have this this little sort of 
you know, Billboard Hot 3 that I, I, I juggle around, but it's mostly Warren Harris. And then I'm putting Yang in there as just kind of a wild card. But as you say, the outlandish ideas can be a bit of a problem. And having done a show about the anti-circumcision movement and having met in the course of doing and in the aftermath of doing the anti-circumcision show that we did, having met some of the worst people I've ever <laughs> met in my life, like really dreadful, horrible people that you never want to encounter on the internet or anywhere else again for the rest of your life. It didn't make me happy. Like, what is it? Like, why is that even an issue? You know, why why is that a presidential issue? It just didn't seem like something he should be getting into. Right. So, I mean, th- this kind of came out when Yang was, I would say, less polished than he is now in terms of his campaign. Uh, I had noticed that he had sort of tweeted a reply to someone saying he was against circumcision. And I thought, you know, that's kind of a weird thing for a presidential candidate to weigh in on. So I talked to his campaign and then they said, well, you know, he's against mandatory circumcision. And I was like, well, that's not really an issue in the country, you know. <laughs> so then they just had him call me up and talk about it, which, uh, you know, again, I mean, talk about an outlandish thing for a campaign to do. Just say, OK, talk to the candidate about circumcision. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, it. it it, it, I think that's an example of him kind of blundering into something. You know, he, he's just kind of spouting off his ideas all the time. And for the most part, they're about infrastructure, or universal, universal basic income. In this case, he has some thoughts on circumcision that I, I, I think did not uh, really work to his benefit. No, but th- that thing that you describe, it really is kind of interesting. I mean, that the solution to the candidate having maybe made a gaffe was to have the candidate talk in an unscripted way to you. I mean, I was just over the weekend, I was in New York. I was with a lot of people from The New York Times. And as you probably know, they did this this little video series where the candidates all answered kind of, you know, non-traditional questions about themselves. Uh, and they talked to all of the candidates except Biden, who wouldn't do it. Uh, and, and I'm convinced that Biden didn't do it because that's not his campaign staff's solution to Biden, to let him talk unscripted about something they've never heard him talk talk about. So it's kind of interesting that with Yang, they think, all right, well, he's good at explaining himself. Let him talk to Will. Right, exactly. I mean, you know, again, it's just sort of another example of this uh, untraditional campaign they're running. Right. So he but he does need to, I think, maybe clear that up even more or maybe even in more context. So another thing that he's struggling with right now is is, I think, support he never asked for. But he is kind of popular on the Pepe the Frog meme spewing alt right, at least among some sectors of that. Can you kind of help us understand how or why that would be happening? Right. So these are alt right people, uh, typically white supremacists uh, who operate on various internet sites, um, 4chan, which is this kind of uh, very chaotic, anarchic internet forum would be the main one. So these are the people who, as you say, Pepe the Frog, they were big Trump fans in 2016. Now, some of them are fed up. They think Trump, you know, didn't, he didn't get the wall. He didn't do all the stuff they wanted. So they're saying, well, you know, if if I'm not going to get that anyway, I might as well support Andrew Yang and get my money, or as they call them, Yang bucks. <laughs> So, I mean, you know, obviously there were moments during the 2015-2016 campaign where Donald Trump was asked about support that he was getting from very unsavory elements of the far right, and he often did not satisfactorily respond to that. Has Yang come up with a, a reasonable response to that kind of support? Yeah, I mean, his campaign has come out very uh, explicitly many times and said essentially they want nothing to do with uh, you know these these racist groups. So that that's certainly to his credit. At the same time, you know that doesn't seem to have deterred many of them. Uh, you know they are still making Andrew Yang memes and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, you know it's obviously dif- difficult uh, to to you can't really blame it on him or anything like that. But he certainly does have this appeal. Right. I mean, if he, if he gets very far on our show, I've decided we're going to have to do a whole episode about Dungeons and Dragons because we've never had a president who really played a lot of Dungeons and Dragons growing up, you know, and we know from Yang's bio that he was kind of a lonely kid, a little bit of a bullied kid. kid. So he did. I mean, he really is. He would be the nerdiest president president ever, I say. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it, uh, I didn't realize he was a Dungeons and Dragons fan. Yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, he's got a lot of policies. I don't know if there's one or two of them that you'd like to talk about. His policies include everything from empowering MMA fighters to free marriage counseling for all to the American Mall Act to some things that are a little less boutique. boutique-y. Are there one or two that jump out at you? Yeah. So there's one that, that that strikes me that, you know, he apparently he may have changed the name on this, but it was essentially an infrastructure program called the uh, the Legion of Builders and Destroyers, which sounds like something out of a, a science fiction <laughs> novel or something. You know, in practice, it's essentially. 
think I, be... I think Aquaman was in both of them. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So you know, it's essentially like a you know almost like a New Deal type infrastructure program. Uh, but you know, it, it, I believe the the Legion would have a Legionary commander or something. You know, I mean, actually, you know, speaking of Dungeons and Dragons, maybe we're seeing some influence there. <laughs> yes. Well, on the other so, but is there more to it than just a goofy name? I mean, what is he really getting at? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, essentially, just like a a, a really expensive, really wide ranging, um, you know, it's, 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 uh, infrastructure construction and then destruction of, uh, you know, out, outdated uh, roads and stuff like that. So, um, you know, it, it's the same kind of infrastructure, you know, that the, the Democrats and Republicans have both been calling for. Andrew Yang puts it in kind of a punchy way that, again, I, I think shows that he has some talent at sort of making things go viral and making things that all stick in your head in a way that other policies from other politicians don't. Yeah, I mean, I, I think also, I, I've used the term game theory a couple of times in this conversation, and that's because I also think, you know, sort of in the sense that, you know, people who do sabermetrics and stuff like that are revolutionized sports, people who, who are quants, you know, data freaks, uh, have re- revolutionized sports. Yang strikes me as a guy who started out and he thought, what do I have to do? What's the first thing I have to solve? And that was probably getting enough support uh, numerically to qualify for debates. You know, and he did it. He, I mean, he, he solved a difficult to solve problem and he identified that as the problem and now he's got the first thing that he wanted which is going to be a very large audience uh, on Thursday night I guess I guess I'm asking you to speculate you sort of wonder what he's going to do at that moment with that uh, audience a chance to talk to a lot of people for the first time yeah, I mean, certainly this has been, as you say, this is the goal. I mean, he, he's sort of like, well, you know, either I can, you know, get on the stage and put out my ideas and then that'll help me rise in the polls, or I'll just kind of spit these ideas out and hopefully they'll get adopted by some of the other candidates. All right. So uh, Thursday night will be, well, Monday and uh, Wednesday and Thursday night will be very, very interesting. Uh, and we thank uh, very much Will Summer, tech reporter for the Daily Beast. Thanks for doing this, man. Hey, thanks for having me. Okay. Um, all right. I, oh, I called him man. I'm not supposed to do that. I, like, I really have made it. There's a certain person on public radio who calls people man. And I, I have made a vow not to do that. And I just did it by mistake. Uh, all right. So just to, re- you know what? Let's still just edit that. <laughs> Let's edit it out of the podcast and the rerun. No, we're not going to do that. And y- you know perfectly well who I'm talking about. Who calls people man all the time? It shouldn't be me. All right. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back. Oh, we're going to talk, uh, get in a s- more serious mood because this is, one of the most outrageous uh, criminal cases that I've seen in my lifetime. I hope you're listening. I really hope you listen. We're sick and tired. Yang is breaking the silence. Y'all way too pie. Accept it. All right. Uh, those of you who listen to the show a lot know that I have a lot of respect for the podcast In the Dark, uh, an investigative podcast from EPM Reports, a division of American Public Media. They have done a tremendous job of reporting the case of Curtis Flowers, who has been tried for the same multiple murders six times um, and who has been the subject of not only prosecutorial overreach, but I would say judicial overreach and, and maybe other kind and, and and police overreach. And anyway, um, so uh, and I really recommend I, I mean, we can kind of update you about this and everything, but I do recommend go, going back to the beginning of season two of In the Dark. If you haven't listened to it already, it's just uh, very well reported. And I don't think there's any way to really understand all this uh, and, and the magnitude of it and the outrageousness of it without listening to all of this. And I think it's also fair to say that In the Dark played some role and maybe a major role in getting this case to where it wound up, which is the U.S. Supreme Court. The decision came out last week. So rejoining us uh, is Samara Freemark, who's been on before, reporter and senior producer for In the Dark. Um, Thanks for doing this again. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So uh, the, the... Oral arguments had already been heard. You guys had done a, a show uh, that allowed us to hear some of the oral arguments and some of the responses by the Supreme Court. And it did seem, even at the time, and with those interrogatories, it's it's dangerous to make a bet based on the interrogatories because sometimes judges or justices will ask questions that aren't necessarily exactly what they're thinking. They just want to hear you know, how, the, how the attorneys are going to respond. But setting that reservation aside, it did seem is though some of the more conservative justices uh, who had a problem, had a real problem with the way that this case had been prosecuted. Uh, Alito seemed to have problems and Kavanaugh seemed to have problems. And in fact, those suspicions were correct. Tell us what happened. Yeah, that's right. So when we attended oral arguments, it was really striking to see 
uh, I would call it passion from some of those conservative justices about this case and just a real sense from them that something had gone wrong. And then we saw that play out in the decision, which came down on Friday. Um, it was a decision in favor of Curtis Flowers, so it, it vacated his conviction. And it was written by Justice Kavanaugh, who, again, is, is considered one of the more conservative justices, um, but in oral arguments spoke very strongly, uh, questioned the state very intensely, and really seemed troubled by this. Alito also, also joined, as did Justice Roberts and the four liberals. Um, so we saw a 7-2 decision uh, in favor of overturning Curtis Flowers' conviction. And this this hung primarily on the practice of the prosecutor, Doug Evans, uh, of excluding as many black jurors as possible uh, from the juror, from the actual impaneled uh, jury uh, with asking often many more questions of prospective mm-hmm. black jurors than he did of white jurors. Uh, and Kavanaugh said the numbers speak loudly. Over the course of the first four trials, there were 36 black prospective jurors against whom the state could have exercised a peremptory strike. The state tried tried to strike all 36. Um, So, you know, there's a way in which, uh, and I I don't know how this resonated with you guys emotionally. You've got a lot sunk into this case. You spent a long time with it. But there was a way in which even listening to the interrogatories and then reading the the Kavanaugh decision, it feels like this was kind of a layup for the court that, you know, rather than being a case that could speak to a lot of other cases, this case was so bad, so extreme, departed so far from the norms of jurisprudence that for seven of them anyway, it was a pretty easy one to decide. Yeah, I mean, I think we saw that in the decision. You know, the, 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 the decision was a narrow one. And Justice Kavanaugh says this in the decision. He says, we're making no new laws. Um, we are just taking the previous standard, which is called, which is the Batson standard, and when we apply it to this case, we find that it's been violated. And I think the Supreme Court generally, uh, they, they are wary of big sweeping decisions, um, and this was not one of those. And um, and so, but what we do see in this case is that they did really consider the history of all that had happened in the previous trials as well. They weren't just looking at what had happened in trial six. They were looking at what happened in all of Curtis Flowers' trials. And they were seeing this pattern over and over again of Doug Evans striking jurors. And so that was, to them, uh, really telling. They said, you know, you have to consider that history when you're looking at what happened in the sixth trial. And if you look at that history, it's clear that this one particular juror in trial six was struck because she was black. And you can know that because you can look at what Doug Evans has done in all of these previous trials. Right. Um, so um, you are uh, the, the In the Dark team uh, made a point of being with the, fower, f- the father of Curtis Flowers, Archie Flowers, uh, at the time the decision was handed down. Uh, let's hear a little bit of that from In the Dark. Hey, what you, what, what you got going on? Yeah, well, it's, it's probably all over town by now. <laughs> so how you feeling, man? You said your prayer. You said you proud of him. Love you too, and I'll see you in the final paper. <laughs> okay. Thank you for using me. How do you say? It's all uh, good. He sound good, really. That what you heard him talk, you would he he sound like he was happy. No, he was really. He sure was. I know he was happy because when I go visit him, he didn't have no joy like that. But he he happy. All right, so that's, uh, I should have said at the beginning, that's R.G. Flowers talking to his son, Curtis Flowers, on the phone from prison where Curtis Flowers has been for how many years, uh, Samara Freemark? How long has uh, Curtis Flowers been in? Uh, he's been locked up since 1997, <laughs> January of 97, so more than 20 years. Um, he's been on death row for much of that time. And and uh, if, for those of you who listen to the podcast, uh, all of these people, I think, become uh, larger characters. So we, we know uh, Archie Flowers pretty well at this point. Um, on the other hand, although this is a pretty big victory, a seven to two decision, and we'll come back to the two in just a second, it 
all, all it really could occasion and may occasion, particularly because the prosecutor, Doug Evans, really is kind of a law unto himself uh, in this uh, part of the world. Um, all it may occasion is a seventh trial, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So, you know, the Supreme Court can find this constitutional violation. And um, the remedy for that is the court has the right to a new trial, which, as you said, would be trial number seven. And Doug, there's nothing to stop the same prosecutor, Doug Evans, from trying the case again. And I think at this point, you know, over the course of these six trials, Doug Evans has been found to have violated Batson by three different courts. Mm -hmm. So the trial court has found it, the state Supreme Court has found it, and now the U.S. Supreme Court has found it. And despite that, there's no law that would say that he can't try this case again, which I I think is a little bit shocking. It's shocking to me um, that you you could keep making, you could keep getting caught breaking the law essentially over and over again, and yet there is no rule that's going to take you off the case. And so at this point, Curtis is no longer convicted of these crimes, but he remains under indictment, um, the same indictment that he was put under in 1997. And so he will he will be moved at some point pretty soon, I think, out of Parchman Prison, off of death row. He'll be moved probably to a county jail where he'll be placed in pretrial detention. And then I, I imagine that conversations will begin between Curtis's lawyers and the district's attorney and perhaps the state attorney general's office as well about what's going to happen next. You, know, you say that you were shocked and surprised that a, a prosecutor who had uh, been found uh, in the wrong uh, in two previous trials and now this one uh, of a very specific kind of violation. Once again, this Batson violation is it's the rule based on, I think, Batson versus Kentucky that does not allow prosecutors to consider race in the selection or, or disqualification of jurors. Um, so three strikes in Doug Evans is an out. You were shocked. It was pretty clear listening to those interrogatories that a number of justices, I thought notably uh, Justice Alito, a pretty conservative guy, but I think with a uh, back, uh, background in prosecution, uh, that he was shocked that a guy who'd screwed up that badly hadn't been relieved of command somehow. Absolutely, yeah. We saw that in oral arguments. Justice Alito, a, a very conservative justice uh, in criminal justice cases in particular in many, in many situations, um, but he was incredulous, I would say, at this at this fact that the uh, county attorney or the district attorney could continue to try this case. I think Alito, I believe, was a federal prosecutor, and this probably wouldn't happen in the federal system because your boss would probably take you off the case at a certain point. But Doug Evans doesn't have a boss. There's no one to take him off the case. And so, yeah, we saw Alito being pretty surprised by this. And um, I think probably that's part of why he joined in the majority in this. You know, Alito... Uh, hadn't wanted the court to take this case in the first place. He had opposed the granting of cert. Of, of cert. Um, he felt like it wasn't a case that he wanted the Supreme Court to hear. And so I think the case was just so striking to him. The facts of the case were so striking that he ruled in favor of Curtis Flowers, even though he hadn't wanted the court to hear the case in the first place. Right. Well, I mean, the Supreme Court, they kind of don't often take this kind of case in the sense of they don't often take a case where all they're going to wind up ruling about is this one case. In other words, you know, what they, as you said, this is a narrowly decided case. It, it speaks very specifically to the condition of Curtis Flowers. The Supreme Court likes to take a case that has a question inside it. And, and, right. and this, this is the only question really here was, did this one particular person get a fair trial or not? No, he didn't. We should say that there were two dissenting votes, um, Justice Thomas and Justice, Justice Gorsuch. I haven't read Thomas's um, dissenting opinion yet, his minority opinion, but my, my what I've gathered is that uh, he went big. He not only opposed mm -hmm. the reversal in this case or the setting aside of this verdict, he just doesn't like Batson at all. Right. It was a very fiery dissent. Um, I would say outraged. The tone was outraged. He went into the details of the crime, which was indeed a horrible crime, um, terrible for the victims and their families. Um, he really railed against the court having taken this case to begin with. Uh, he blamed the media, um, the fact that the, the case had received a lot of media coverage, um, for the fact that the, the court even took the case. Um, and then he went further and actually called into question Batson itself, which is the, the standing precedent that, that governs all of these kinds of cases. And he just is not, he's not a fan of Batson. 
I will say so. Justice Gorsuch joined Justice Thomas, but not in the full dissent. Uh, Justice Gorsuch didn't join the part where Thomas um, was disavowing all of Batson. I'm going to offer a little bit of speculation. I won't even ask you to react to this. But when I was listening to all of this and reading about all this, one place my thought went, oh, thoughts went were, this is such an egregious case. It is such a deep violation of the standards of law. Uh, Curtis Flowers is so far away from having received a fair trial. And, and there's a grotesquerie to some of the things that have happened. I actually think John Roberts looked at Brett Kavanaugh and thought, you know what? You need a kind of, you need a lay. You need a case where, first of all, you can join a minor, a majority opinion that has um, a, a, all of the left-leaning judges in it, uh, and that also, as Thomas uh, says, has received quite a bit of uh, of press coverage. You can write a, uh, an opinion that most people would agree with because this is kind of a slam dunk case. So go ahead, you do that one, and you can maybe you know burnish your tarnished image up uh, a little bit. It just seemed like you know a, a good opinion for Kavanaugh to write from his point of view. I do want to just say that one thing that you also did with in, in the Dark, and you've been pretty scrupulous about that, is to talk to the people who still feel very wronged by this decision, wronged by Curtis Flowers. Uh, so let's hear uh, from uh, your conversation with Mary Catherine Briscoe, a mother of Carmen Rigby, one of the people murdered uh, at, the tarni- at the Tardy Furniture location. No, no. he's He's done... His part, I think, he's done what he could. And this, I know, is about worn him out, too. But it's, it's terrible, terrible. You know, I just don't want to think about going through it again. I don't know why they just keep on and on with it. I just, I don't understand that. Because we was trying to forget everything and settle down rest of our lives. So I can't understand why he can't do the same. Um, at the beginning, she's talking about Doug Evans, the prosecutor, that he's done all he can. Um, you try to talk to Doug Evans, too, about this. As usual, he was uh, unforthcoming, said he hadn't even read the opinion at, at that point. Um, you also said that he has no boss. Well, theoretically, the only boss he would have would be the electorate. Uh, he wins He wins elections to become the prosecutor. And, and I assume, based on everything that you've seen, that the Curtis Flowers case, even though it seems like there's this huge abrasion uh, on, on the reputation of American jurisprudence, it doesn't play the same way uh, there in Mississippi. Well, I would say that, uh, yeah, so first of all, yes, his, his boss is the voters. Um, Evans is up for re-election this fall. Uh, but he's running unopposed, mm. so he will be the district attorney um, for the next next years. Um, the the reaction here, I think, as, has always and continues to break down along racial lines. Um, you know, me and, and another reporter, Parker Yesko, are in Mississippi right now and talking to people about their reaction, and we certainly have felt that. Um, so African American people in Winona uh, seem very happy about the decision, very pleased, validated. I would say even overjoyed. Um, most most people that we've talked to um, on the white side of town, it's different. And um, you know, Doug Evans, the the population of Winona is, is slightly more than 50% white. And so I think you see that dynamic p- playing out when you look at the choices that the elected officials, especially the district district attorney, are making. Um, We're going to leave it there, but uh, keep on reporting uh, Samara Freemark and the rest of In the Dark. We'll keep uh, listening to your podcast. And thanks for joining us today to talk about last week's Supreme Court decision in the Curtis Flowers case. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about those uh, facilities along the border and whether they deserve the name concentration camp. Spoiler, they do.
I'm going to say something counterintuitive, at least for those of you who are listening at 1 o'clock, listening live at 1 o'clock. Kion Wolf isn't here today. The, the reason that's counterintuitive is you just heard her voice if you're listening live. Um, she's not here right now, so uh, she's not here to read the, the credits. Uh, so I will say the credits. Uh, this uh, show is produced by Betsy Kaplan, uh, who most often does re- does produce our Monday Scramble. She's our senior producer. Jonathan McPants is sitting where Wolfie usually sits. Uh, he's on the board today. And I think, I can't really see in the dark. Is that Jesse who's in there? Who's Jesse? Our, our excellent intern, Jesse, is there working phones for us. Uh, and I don't know who played the part of Bill Curry. I didn't think that through very carefully. Well, it could be, uh, well, it could be Andrew Yang. Who knows? Uh, tomorrow, we're going to do a show on robocalls. And I don't know too much yet about it. It's being produced by Josh Nalea, and which tells me that it's probably going to take a fairly sinister uh, approach to, to robocalls. Not that there's really kind of a My Little Pony approach that you can take to, to robocalls, but you know it, this could get pretty dark is what I'm warning you. Uh, all right, so uh, here we go with our final segment. Uh, and one of the things that was clear in the dialogue of this weekend, you know, whether you're watching Sunday morning uh, news talk shows or just paying attention to social media is opinion is starting to coalesce around this problem of these detention facilities at the border. Uh, And the term concentration camp is starting to be used to describe them. Uh, And I think one of the things that drove this, not only the visual details that we're starting to get from those concentration camps or from those detention centers, uh, and believe me, the government is trying to keep those to a minimum, the number of times we see sites from there. But oddly enough, a court exchange. So uh, the Justice just Department Sarah, uh, lawyer Sarah Fabian uh, appeared before, before three Ninth Circuit Court judges, and they were basically questioning her about whether these um, facilities could ever rise to the level of safe and sanitary facilities. Uh, and they, dis- they themselves described situations where people, including children, uh, are s- trying to sleep on a bare floor with a metallic blanket for cover and that's it, and the lights never go off, and how can that possibly be safe and sanitary? And she was kind of doing a humada, humada, humada thing about that. So uh, we want to talk more about this. Obviously, concentration camp is not a term that we want to use lightly. Uh, It's not a term that we want to misuse. But David Perry is joining us, freelance journalist, a columnist for Pacific Standard, and a historian working at the University of Minnesota. He wrote a piece this weekend for Pacific Standard on why detention centers on the southern border are concentration camps. Welcome to our conversation, David Berry. Oh, and I should probably actually make sure that David Berry is up on the board. See, this is the kind of thing that happens. Uh, David Berry, welcome to our conversation. Thank you so much for having me. So, um, yeah, this isn't a term. I think for a lot of people, concentration camp has only one context, uh, yeah. and that is the Holocaust. Now, yeah. one of the things that you did in researching this piece is uh, even find a book where somebody's written the history of concentration camps, and it really, it is a term that that could be used applicably well before the 1930s and 1940s. That's right. I think. There, I mean, I think there are two things going on. I think there are lots of people. Um, so I want everyone to know I'm Jewish and a historian, and that's really where I come from as I, as I talk about this. Um, I think there are definitely a lot of people who deliberately want to evoke the Holocaust, and, and that's a good discussion. I think that's not inappropriate, though it's complicated. Um, but what I really want to say beyond that, and lots of people have written about why it's relevant to talk about the Holocaust, and, and many of them like me, Jewish, and I think that's really an important conversation, and I'm happy to talk about it. But what I really wanted to do in my piece is to talk about how normal terribly normal concentration camps are in global history, particularly in sort of the history of imperialism, but also in U.S. history. So I'm calling you now from the Twin Cities, um, and every time I go by the airport, as I talk about, I drive by a concentration camp. There's this place, Fort Snelling. It's really a pretty fort. It overlooks where the Minnesota and the Mississippi River comes together. And during the Dakota War in the 1860s, it was used as a prison camp to, in an extrajudicial way to take families and concentrate them there and try to use that installation as part of a tool to destroy their culture, to get them out of this land, to turn that land over to white settlers. It is clearly part of it. Uh, It is clearly a concentration camp, just as it was used in South Africa and Cuba and the Philippines later that century and continuing for decades afterwards concentration camps are a normal part of our history. 
Now, I, I think it's fair to ask what makes a concentration camp a concentration camp. Why, why isn't it a detention center? Why isn't it uh, some kind of uh, other way of segregating a group of people, either pre-trial or, 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 or pre-deportation? Well, a- Andrea Pitzer, who I've talked about and who has been, um, who has been working on, on this issue for a long time, talks about the detention of civilians without trial based on group identity. Um, and that's, that's sort of the core definition for her that changes sort of from a refugee camp or a prison camp to something she wants to talk about, a concentration camp, where you identify a group, you detain them en masse without trial. Um, I, I want to push a little past that kind of with this idea of aiming towards ethnic cleansing, aiming towards removing a people from where they are, isolating them, taking them from where they are, and putting them somewhere else, a mission of dehumanization. And that's something that I think is really important in looking at these Trump camps along our our southern border, is that since the minute we we have had prison installations for um, people deemed illegal immigrants for a long time, but what we haven't had is in this moment, which since literally the the, the first speech Donald Trump gave uh, announcing his run for president, he has been engaged in the systematic dehumanization of immigrants, particularly from Latin America, and that has only intensified since he's become president. So it's these installations linked to a broader kind of dehumanization message um, put into practice now with these children who, in fact, are being kept, children and adults, in horrific conditions. So you have horrific conditions, dehumanization, detention based on group identity, all of these things come together to fit very neatly, again, sadly, into the long history of concentration camps. Right. So, and we talk, we talk about these inhuman conditions, um, uh, and there's a death toll from inhuman conditions. That's right. At least seven children are, are known to have died in immigration custody since last year, after almost a decade in which no child reportedly died, died while in the custody of the U.S. Customs and Border Protection. So we've had, you know, and, and that can be understood in a number of ways to you and me. It's a horrific tragedy, which does departs substantially from the practices that we think of as American practices. That you hold, If you're going to hold children in detention, you're going to make sure that they're well cared for until yeah. some disposition is arrived at. This seems like the opposite of that, and it seems like these deaths are treated almost the way a store owner would treat breakage. Yeah, I mean, I think it is, it's really significant that after days and days of this administration. I just saw this sort of 20 minutes before coming, coming on air with you, so I haven't looked at the whole story. But after days and days, the administration saying they can't do anything, it's all because Congress won't pass funding. In fact, children are being removed from a camp that was deemed unsafe right now, as I understand this morning. Again, I haven't confirmed that, but it's clear that there are things that they can do. There are efforts they can put. I'm very interested in, in the connections between disability justice and immigration justice, and I've been following over the last couple of years all the stories about children whose medicine is taken away from them, whose access to care is taken away from them, um, kind of, again, systematically separate them from their belongings, put them somewhere else, and then see what happens down the road. It does seem willful, and again, it seems of, as an attempt to put into practice this administration's rhetoric of dehumanization. And that ties back into the, the story of the Holocaust, right? So we've talked about the history of concentration camps in American history, but the story of the Holocaust starts with this kind of dehumanization rhetoric, and then you see movement into concentrating the people being dehumanized, mostly but not exclusively Jews, uh, into these camps, and then we all know where it accelerates. So people who are invoking the Holocaust are trying to say, we have to stop this before we continue to accelerate down a terrible road. Let's hear from one of the people invoking this, uh, as she seems to have done so often recently, driving us uh, linguistically into uh, a more serious consideration of something that deserves serious consideration. Here's uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. The United States is running concentration camps on our southern border, and that is exactly what they are. They are concentration camps. I want to talk to the people that are concerned enough with humanity to say that we should not, that never again means something. Now, one of the ways that uh, there was blowback against that was that she didn't have the right to use that term. Uh, she wasn't from an ethnicity uh, that had suffered from concentration camps. You are from an ethnicity that has suffered from concentration camps. How did you process her words? 
Well, well, first of all, I just want to say that neither Megan McCain nor Liz Cheney speak for American Jews. Right, um, yes. I really just want to say that a lot. And I'm getting very tired of people like them speaking on behalf of the Holocaust. There are a lot of Jews in America. We disagree. We argue. I like to say two Jews, three opinions. Um, we don't need Liz Cheney jump, jumping in there. Um, but kind of more, more to the point... Um, I do think we have to be very careful in loosely comparing everything that's bad to the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that that's something we should do thoughtfully. Um, that we also, though, can't say that the Holocaust can only be brought in as a comparison in situations that are exactly like the Holocaust, because that's not hopefully going to happen again. Um, you know, I think that Ocasio-Cortez, she's not Jewish, but she is... Uh, Latino woman who was looking at uh, the dehumanization and incarceration, in some cases death, of Latin American immigrants. So, you know, she has one kind of claim on, on escalating the situation rhetorically, and I have a different kind of claim as an American Jew. Uh, and I think that there's room to talk about where we use the Holocaust as, as, a, as a reference point. Um, I do think, again, when you have years of systematic dehumanization followed by the creation of these camps and these terrible conditions, um, that it is not necessarily inappropriate to say, never again is now, that this is the moment in which we can still act before things spiral so far out of control, before so many people die. That's not saying that either of us think it's going to turn into a death camp situation. I, I don't think it is. Um, but I think it could get a lot worse if we don't act soon. And I think the other part of that, though, David, is it's already been pretty bad and the government knew about it. So in 2018, yeah. the inspector general of the Department of Homeland Security went and, and inspected, did a surprise inspection of some of these facilities. He found spoiled food, dilapidated bathrooms with unusable toilets, uh, mold conditions, peeling paint, uh, you know, d just a, a, a hellhole. Uh, that was in 2018, and, and it does seem as though, uh, and I also worth mentioning, these people are held in civil detention. They are not, right. they're not being held in criminal prisons or anything resembling that. That's what civil detention looks like at the border. And, and I think the reaction to all of that is fine <laughs> until somebody makes us change it. That's fine if they're sleeping on bare floors and they're cold and they're uncomfortable and they don't have toothbrushes and some of them have the flu. Fine. We're not doing anything about that. And it does feel like this administration, having sort of made it a year since this conversation first started, the first time there was a big debate around concentration camps and these camps, and we all heard, you know, the voices of children crying and screaming, as, and then it's been a year from that, that they are building a machine. They are taking pre-existing material um, and practices within um, the Department of Homeland Security and ratcheting them up into a machine to do this again and again and again, trying to dehumanize these people, trying to drive them out of this country, trying to make sure no people don't come through terror and horror and fear. And, I mean, if never again isn't now, based on what I just said, then, then when is it? At what point uh, is it? I am comfortable saying that this is the kind of system this is the kind of thinking, the kind of government institution, the kind of people like Sarah Fabian willing to defend horrible things because it's her just her job. She's just following orders. Um, I think this is the time when we have to say, how far are you willing to let this go? And each person has to, to stop and think about that. When are they willing to act if not now? Right. It, it does seem as though opinion is coalescing now in a way that may begin to make this less of a partisan issue. Uh, yeah. Ocasio-Cortez, by getting involved, may have made it intrinsically a little bit of a partisan issue. But I just I know lots of Republicans just, you know, they're not they're not members of Congress, but I know lots of Republicans who who are moved by this and who can't stand the idea that we're doing this. I, I hope so. I mean, one of the things that has been really um which has made me glad in the last sort of four days, is to see so many American Jews, writers, uh, journalists, historians, some liberal like me, you know, I, I, I wear my politics kind of on my sleeve, um, but, but not, not all, really step up and talk about the history here, saying, listen, there's a history in this country and globally of this kind of installation being used in these particular sorts of ways. That does seem to be what's happening now. Those are the facts on the ground. Now, what are we going to do next? And, and there, I think there's a lot of debate about that. But I do feel like, including from the Jewish community, um, with a few outliers, we're, we're really, as you say, opinion is coalescing to say this is, this is just wrong. 
Right. Uh, David Perry, thank you so much for joining us. Freelance journalist, columnist for the Pacific Standard, where he wrote about this issue this weekend, a historian working at the University of Minnesota. Special thanks to uh, senior producer Betsy Kaplan for making this all come together. Uh, thanks also to Will Summer uh, and Samara Freemark for being on the show. Uh, get ready for robocalls tomorrow. I think it's going to be more than robocalls somehow. In fact, I'm a little worried about this show. Uh, but we'll see you tomorrow. Okay.